Hello, everybody. Good to be back with you again. We have another case support for you. This is on a, a couple that came to me with unexplained infertility. And I use unexplained in quotes because very often it's not unexplained. It's just not diagnosed properly. Or, um, and also having unexplained IVF failures repeatedly with good quality embryos that were tested chromosomally and genetically and proven to be normal and yet she failed to conceive. Before we start, let me again invite you, those of you that are watching, if you're interested in having a Skype consultation or a FaceTime consultation with me, to call my assistant, Paddy Converse, who can be reached at 702-533-2691. Again, 702-533-2691. And if you live in Canada or in the United States, you can also reach her by toll-free number at 1-800-780-7437. Call her and ask Patty to set you up with a Skype or Facebook consultation with me. Be sure when you call her to give her your, all your information. Patty will immediately turn around and send you a questionnaire to complete. Please fill it in in as detailed as you can, and along with any medical records that you might have available. We can always get the rest later, but so send us what you've got. What will then happen is Patty will set a date for you, and I will go about developing a report preliminarily and then adjust it after our consultation and forward to you the final report with what I think is going on and give you a roadmap as to how I think you should go forward in future treatments. My preference is that you have that future treatment with your own personal local doctor, your reproductive endocrinologist, but if for any reason you cannot do that, I've just started doing IVF again, but in Los Angeles at Century City, in a beautiful facility, with a guy who worked with me for 10 years, and I go there every quarter to do a batch of IVF cases. My first batch will be in September, starting on the 16th. For those of you interested, please let Paddy know immediately. And then the next will be in December and the next will be in March. And so we'll continue doing four of them a year. Um, you can also reach Paddy by emailing her. And her email address is concierge, C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, -E, at sureivf.com. Finally, you can reach her by going directly to my website, the one you're on right now, shareivf.com, www.shareivf.com. And when you get to the blog at the home page, you'll find an enrollment form that you can complete. Fill it in, send it off to Paddy. Be sure to include your personal cell phone number because she will call you back and arrange to send you the questionnaire and get things going. Okay, so let's move on to Ingrid and Jesse. These are the two people. I've chosen these fictitious names. I'd really like you to um, um, remember that I will not divulge the names of patients. This is a matter of professional secrecy and confidentiality. Now, Ingrid is 37 years of age and Jesse 41. The couple had been trying to have a baby for six years. There was, this was the first marriage for both of them. Except that Jesse had initiated a prior pregnancy uh, eight years previously. And he tested perfectly normally and had normal semen analysis. Ingrid had been through the works. She'd been found to ovulate normally through hormonal testing basal body temperature charting, home ovulation testing, and ultrasound confirmation, and also blood hormone tests. So she appeared to be a normal ovulator. Both the fallopian tubes were normal, as evidenced by doing a hysterosalpingogram. They were patent and open. She'd never had a laparoscopy to confirm the absence of mild endometriosis which can cause this problem. She had been through additional testing, 
uh, both she and her husband had been carrier typed for their chromosomal makeup, and that was perfectly normal as well. Now, this couple had been through four failed attempts at intrauterine insemination, a procedure that I introduced in 1984, where you inject washed and enhanced sperm into the uterus of a woman who receives fertility drugs to confirm ovulation. She did not conceive. She then went on to do four IVF attempts using her own eggs. In all cases, the stimulation she had been on with fertility drugs led to good response, eggs were harvested, and she had a total of six chromosomally normal or euploid blastocysts transferred in the course of four frozen embryo transfers or FETs to her uterus. But in none of them did she even have a blip as far as the pregnancy test results were concerned. So truly, for all intent, intent and purposes, this was a case of unexplained infertility and unexplained idea of failure repeatedly. I'd like to again point something out to you. 10% of people have infertility of an, a so-called unknown cause, and in most cases, the cause is because of the fact that they didn't, weren't thoroughly tested enough to find out the cause of the problem. In some of the cases, there's a genuinely no definable cause. Now, the commonest causes of unexplained infertility through inadequate testing is that the woman has undiagnosed early or intermediately staged pelvic endometriosis, which is asymptomatic. Normally, women who have endometriosis have pain with their periods, pain with ovulation, pain with intercourse, and that is usually the case. But in some cases, there's nothing. And even the mildest form of endometriosis, where the deposits of endometrium growing inside the pelvis, outside the uterus, produce toxins, will prevent the egg from easily fertilizing by compromising the envelopment of the egg, which is known as the zona pellucida, making it relatively impervious to sperm, so the chance of conceiving is essentially about six times less than ordinarily would be the case. So instead of having at her age a 20, 20%, 15 to 20% chance of a baby per month of trying and an 80% chance in a year, the chance of having a baby would be reduced to about 3% per month and maybe about 40% within four to five years. When that happens, the cause of the infertility is due to an external factor that takes eggs that otherwise leave the ovaries normal to reach the tubes and make it impossible for them to be easily fertilized. But there's also another common cause of unexplained infertility, and that is the presence of adhesions around the ends of the tubes which cannot be seen by a hysterosalpingogram or a dye x-ray test where you inject a radio-opaque dye into the uterus and you see the tubes filling and spilling normally, but what you can see is whether there are adhesions around the ends of the tubes or the little protrusions or petals or fimbria at the end, preventing them from applying properly to the ovary to pick up the egg. That you also won't see. The only way to diagnose either endometriosis of the early variety and or adhesions around the tube is through a procedure called laparoscopy. And then there is another cause which is due to hormonal factors where there's a hormonal dysfunction compromising either ovulation itself, making it occur too early or too late, or causing what we call a luteal phase defect with a hormonal support for the implanting embryo that is progesterone estrogen production after ovulation is compromised. That can be diagnosed by hormonal testing, measuring the length of time from the ovulation to the point of menstruation, and by doing biopsies of the uterine lining uh, and looking at the endometrium to see whether it's in phase, whether the implantation potential is normal. 
There's one other cause of unexplained so-called infertility, and that is that the man may have normal sperm count and motility, but there are other subtle problems with the sperm that prevent it from fertilizing the egg, such as the, pre pre such as the presence of antibodies to sperm that the man produces and prevents the sperm from penetrating the egg or m moving properly to get to that point, or it can be due to subtle DNA problems in the sperm which cannot be detected through a regular semen analysis. It requires more sophisticated testing, such as the sperm chromatin structure assay, which looks for something we call the DNA fragmentation index, which normally should be under 15. Between 15 and 30 is a gray zone, and over 30 is abnormal. Here, those are but a few, but relatively common causes of what is often misdiagnosed as unexplained, when in reality it's simply a case of undiagnosed infertility. But in the case of Ingrid and Jesse, they bypassed all of the external problems that endometriosis can produce by doing IVF and transferring embryos to the uterus, and they also bypassed uh, a problem relating to the sperm because they made good embryos and blastocysts. And they had, they had had a partial evaluation of the uterine cavity by hysterosalpingogram, which although it's not optimal, you need to do also what's called a sonohistogram or a water ultrasound, or you need to do a hysteroscopy to look inside the uterus to make, it no make sure it's normal. Ostensibly, that appeared to be normal as well. There was one thing, however, that they did not look for that is very important, and that is the other cause and relatively common cause of failure to conceive with embryos that are otherwise normal and should have made a baby. With the real with, in reality, six normal blastocysts that are chromosomally tested and normal transferred to the uterus should have at least made a pregnancy even if the pregnancy didn't go to full fruition. The fact that it didn't do that suggests that the likely cause of this patient's problem is an implantation dysfunction. Let's go to it again. There's a seed, the embryo. There's the soil, the uterine lining. You've got to put the seed in a good soil, which has to be receptive. If you keep putting in good seeds, but there's still no pregnancy, it's obvious, it's a no-brainer, that causes an implantation dysfunction. And there are three primary causes of implantation dysfunction. The first one is that, as I mentioned earlier, the uterine cavity isn't regular inside, and the hysterosalpingogram, the sonohistogram, or the hysteroscopy can pick that up. The second is that the uterine lining is too thin to allow the roots of the embryo to attach properly, that remains to be evaluated. But the third and the commonest cause of an implantation dysfunction is immunologic implantation dysfunction, which I abbreviate to call IID. There are cells in the uterine lining of all women called natural killer cells. They're large lymphocytes, immune cells that journey to the uterus from the bone marrow every month. They multiply there and reach a crescendo in concentration approximately six or seven days after ovulation when the embryo would ordinarily implant. And these, uh, these natural killer cells at that point start to produce growth factors called cytokines of two varieties, Th1 and Th2. The Th1 cytokines attract the roots of the embryo into the wall of the uterus to form the placenta, the lifeline for the baby, without which there is no baby. And um, so the Th1, they produce Th1 cytokines, interferon gamma, TNF alpha, that attack the roots of the embryo and damage or destroy it, often before the woman even knows she's pregnant. She can lose it if they're in excess. But there needs to be a balance for orderly pregnancy between Th1 and Th2 cytokines. If there's excessive Th1 production, the embryo can be lost before the woman knows she's pregnant, 
or it could be lost as a chemical pregnancy after a few days of taking, or as an early miscarriage. So it's really, really important to know if you're dealing with an immunologic problem. Interestingly, one third of women with endometriosis will have activated or toxic natural killer cells which overproduce Th1 cytokines. The same occurs where there's a family or personal history of immunologic disorders such as lupus, erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, or hypothyroidism. These are all autoimmune causes. The treatment is to do IVF and to render the uterus receptive by infusing a substance called intralipid along with steroids such as dexamethasone taken orally starting 14 days, 10 to 14 days before the embryo is transferred and continuing all the way to the 10th week of pregnancy. If you do that, you can eliminate the problem for most causes, not all, but most causes of activated toxic natural killer cells. So here we have a situation where this couple has no problem producing good embryos that are chromosomally normal, but they clearly have an implantation problem, which could be anatomical due to a thin lining or irregular uterine cavity. But if it's present, it more than likely is going to be linked to uh, an immunologic implantation dysfunction. We test for it by doing a sonohistogram or hysteroscopy to confirm the normalcy of the uterine cavity. We test for it by doing an assessment of the thickness of the uterine lining at the time of normal ovulation. It should be around 9 to, to 12, ideally, but if it's over 8, it usually is all right, 8 to 9 being a gray zone. Under 8 is incompatible, in my opinion, with a healthy implantation. And third, blood needs to be sent to one of four reproductive immunology reference laboratories in the United States. The one I prefer to work with is a lab called ReproSource, located in Boston. And they'll run what we call a K562 target cell test, which tests natural killer cell activation, antiphospholipid antibodies, which are often also raised with endometriosis, antithyroid antibodies, which is thyroglobulin antibodies and thyroid peroxidase antibodies, to look for a possible autoimmune thyroid condition known as Hashimoto's disease. And then in rare cases, we test both the man and the woman to see if they don't have a very rare form of immunologic implantation dysfunction known as alloimmune implantation dysfunction, where the cause of the natural killer cell activation is too much genetic similarity between the man and the woman. I'm not going to go into that now because I don't think it applies here. And once we've done all those tests and we then stimulate it appropriately with a good protocol, which I've described on numerous occasions, then we will um, get embryos, make blastocysts, and again test them through PGS to make sure the embryos are normal, put one to two in the uterus with appropriate treatment of an underlying immunologic implantation component linked to natural killer cell activation and she should get pregnant relatively easily. So that's what I would do in this case. Well, obviously, that's not all been done yet. I've just spoken to her recently. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens. I've given her that recommendation to the couple. They're going to continue with the testing. And if their doctor is not eager or willing to do all the things I've recommended, they've agreed to come to me in Los Angeles for me to do IVF on them, as I said, I'm doing batches every four, every three months, starting on the 16th of September. If any of you are interested in talking to me, please call, email, go to the website, or uh, and let us know of that interest, and we'll get back to you. I hope that's been interest to you, and thank you for your interest. Bye bye.